I can tell you a point of view of Dr. Carl Jung, to whom I am indebted for most of what I will be saying in these two weeks. He said that everybody does their inner work. And the only choice there is whether you're going to do it intelligently or stupidly. You can do inner work in some of the ways that we will be talking about. Work with your dreams, work with fantasy, imagination, counterwork, reading of mythology, many, many of those things which are purposeful and intelligent interior work. One's work of prayer, one's inner life. Or you can live out your inner life and your inner work by your neurosis, which is pure inner work on the stupidest possible level. If you don't do your inner work, it will do you. It will come up as anxiety. It will come up as phobias. It will come up as allergies. It will come up as accidents in your life or the general worry or anxiety or loneliness which plagues so many modern people. And that is truly inner work, but just an incredibly stupid way of doing it. However, it gets done that way. I have to tell you about a lecture I did once at a Roman Catholic seminary in Minneapolis. I was invited to come and talk on anything they wished. This was nearly 20 years ago, so it was a bit more astounding then than it would be nowadays. The devil got in me, and I decided I was going to do a lecture on the general subject of your neurosis as a low-grade religious experience. <laughs> well, I had that seminary upside down and shaken in no time at all. <clears throat> To hear about one's inner work in its stupid form, one's phobias, one's neurosis, one's upsets, one's jealousies, one's um, general nonsense, which goes on slightly worse in seminaries than most places, contrary to expectation, is one's religious life bumping along <coughs> on three flat tires. Well, I had more fun with that bunch of seminarians. <clears throat> I only had uh, the day with them, but I shook them up fiercely. The head of the seminary was in my consulting room next morning. <clears throat> and he is now a Jungian analyst with three children. <clears throat> <clears throat> that wasn't my intention, but... Uh, <clears throat> Inner work sometimes uh, goes, goes some odd directions. Inner work. You will be learning in these days to come that the most stupid things that happen to you, one's loneliness or one's anxiety, or those things that plague one, are truly the interior life in progress, but as I say, stupidly proceeding. And there are ways of doing it better than that. I don't know any nice, neat way of doing one's inner work or going the inner journey. It bumps along pretty uh, clumsily in any case, but one can do a bit better with it, with some help and some intention. I spent a good deal of time in India, which I love. Magnificent country, because they treasure the inner world, they spend more time at it, they respect it in a sense that culturally speaking we do not. And I'll tell you a story about how important inner work is in India. I had the rare good fortune of being adopted into an Indian family. To my horror I found out when I arrived in India that I was an untouchable. Nobody had prepared me for that. But this family adopted me. I made friends with one of their sons. He took me off to the little village where they'd all come from. I was the first white man ever to set foot in that village that anybody had remembered. And I probably will plague you with many stories out of India before you were through with it. 
But while I was in the village, Amba Shankar, my good friend, took me one day by ox cart. It was a point of meditation for me that I left Los Angeles at 600 miles an hour on British Airways and I arrived in Helsinki on one mile an hour in an ox cart. And somehow that was correct. So I was in the ox cart again, and Amba Shankar took me off to the great mango tree. Well, Amba Shankar was not one to explain things very much, but I had such a profound regard for him that I trusted him as I would trust few people on the face of the earth. He said, we're going to go see the great mango tree. All right. So, ox cart, and off we go. After a time, we arrive at uh, the mango grove, and there's one particularly fine and beautiful mango tree there, in full uh, size. No fruit at that time of year, but a magnificent tree. And we meditated under the mango tree, and uh, we loafed about, and we sat, and um, we had lunch. And we waited, and I knew something was afoot, but I also knew to wait. Finally, Amba Shankar out with it, and he said, this is where my father meditated. And one day, the great yogi, who has lived in this part of India for hundreds of years, he's of incalculable age, came to my father and took him away and initiated him. They took him for three days and put him through a terrible time. My father suffered frightfully. It was like three days going through the underworld. And the great yogi finally brought him back and put him under the mango tree, unhurt. And that's how my father got his enlightenment. That's, that's how he found his redemption, or that's how, how he came to his enlightenment. Well, I was so thrilled with this that the hair was standing on the back of my neck. And that mango tree suddenly became a holy place for me. Amba Shankar insisted that both he and I be photographed under the great mango tree. Those pictures reside in hallowed places on two places on the face of the earth on opposite uh, ends of the earth. This affected me profoundly, and it immediately crept into my fantasy life. <clears throat> and the idea, of course fantasy, that somebody could be plucked out from under a tree and carried off somewhere and put through an initiation and be brought back enlightened and set down under the tree again, thrilled me just um, unspeakably. I was happy all day with that story. Well, weeks went by. I returned to Pondicherry, which was the other place I spent my time in India, you know, approximately 1,500 miles away on the eastern seacoast. Hawasangi is a little tiny village you'll never find on anybody's map. It's right about the middle of India, halfway between um, Chalapur and Bijapur, if you want to find those on the map, but it's not important but they're on an inner map, indelibly. So, 1,500 miles away, I was doing my inner work. I was doing uh, the practice of active imagination, which I will be talking to you about. It's a particular kind of meditation in which one goes into the world of dreams, wide awake, fully awake, and takes part in the dream. It's even more powerful than dreaming. And my fantasy, having seized upon the great mango tree and the yogi who was of inestimable age and who sometimes came and plucked people from under mango trees and took them off for their enlightenment, got into my dream and fantasy life. And before I knew what was happening, the great yogi had come and taken me in fantasy, please understand from under the great mango tree and put me through three days of initiation in which he touched on every fright and every fear and every phobia I carry around in this large body of mine. Well, it was a frightful thing. It lasted 
in fantasy several days. That is, in Pondicherry, I went back to this fantasy several days in a row. And the great yogi finally, having purged me of everything that he could get rid of out of this stupid frame of mine, took me back to the great mango tree and left me. Well, I went dashing off to Amba Shankar and I said, Amba, I have had a fantasy. This is the most extraordinary thing. And in my room in International House, the guest house where I lived, in Pondicherry, 1,500 miles from Helisangi, I've had this fantasy. Now please understand that it's a fantasy. And I recounted what had happened. Amba Shankar was delighted. He was out of his head with joy. And he said, Robert, I knew the great yogi was going to come and get you and give you your enlightenment. I said, now, Amber, remember, this is a fantasy in my room in the International House. No, 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 Amber said. It happened. It's real. I said, Amber, please get the wax out of yours and understand this happened up in my room, 1,500 miles away from the great mango tree. Amber said, no, it happened, because it happened in the inner world, and the inner world is realer, more real, than the outer world, and it happened to you just as it happened to my father. Well, okay, I understood something else about India. You listen to the tales of India as inner tales, not outer ones. But I was pleased. And I tell you the story now, so that you'll know how, how greatly and how deeply some people in the world value the inner world or the inner journey. The journey of fantasy, the journey of imagination, the journey of dreams in India is more revered than is that world which we call outer reality, which is partly why India neglects its outer reality so much and why it's so dirty and why we poor Westerners get so sick so often when we go there. They neglect the outer world, we neglect the inner world. And I prescribe for myself and for you that we tend both of them equally well. So I mean that as a way, as a beginning, for the exploration of the inner journey. It's just as real, but no more real, than was your journey coming to Pecos today. It has its own laws, it has its own way, it has its own language, and if you're wise enough, and if you're careful enough, and if you have enough differentiation in your structure, you'll be able to tend both of these worlds equally well. <clears throat> and like St. Teresa, who was given to visions very frequently, one noted that she never had a, a vision when she was cooking the omelet because she would burn it otherwise. So in the visionary world and the cooking the omelet world don't need to collide with each other. They're both real worlds. And I insist that there are two sides of a single world of such majesty and such beauty and such joy that we scarcely can imagine it.